As long as I can remember, I've always been fascinated by big ideas, sort of mystical stuff like, why are we here? What's my purpose in life? Where do we go when we die? Things like that. Now, I'm still thinking about those things, and as a student of Buddhism, um, sometimes I'm around people who give me some clues. I was at a talk recently, and one of the teachers um, was talking about the, the suffering, the root of all suffering, which is attachment, grasping. Now, just as an illustration of this, I look at my cell phone like many, many, many times a day. And I read research recently that says that, you know, we're looking at our cell phones over 100 times a day. Now, since I've read that, I think about it now when I look at my cell phone. Sometimes I'm really looking for an answer to a question that I asked or a response. Most of the time, I'm escaping from something. What is it that I'm escaping from? Is it that awkward silence when you're in a room and no one's talking? Is it that void inside? Well, my teacher says that what we're escaping from is the fear of being alone and ultimately the fear of death. So that's something to really think about when you've got to look at your cell phone now. Now, death is something that was part of everyday life until a few generations ago. Even in my grandmother's day, in this culture, it's really changed. Now death is not something that we see on a day-to-day -day basis for the most part. It's removed. It's medicalized. We have our elders move into a long-term care facility or a nursing home where they pass away peacefully, and we never see them again. Or there's a medical emergency, you're rushed to the hospital, all kinds of medical procedures are done, last-ditch efforts to save your life. Now, the medical establishment is trained to do that. Doctors, nurses, they're trained to save lives. But people, 75% of people interviewed have said that they would prefer to die at home. Only 25% of people actually get to die at home. So how, how can we change that? Because death is not part of everyday life anymore, we don't talk about it. Doctors are not trained to talk about it. They're trained to save lives. Because it's removed from us, it's become a stigma. Let's face it, when you saw that there was a talk about death on the program today, you probably wanted to run out the door and say, well, I guess I'll, I, can, I can skip that one. We don't talk about it because we're afraid of it. Now, Song Young Rinpoche, he is a Tibetan monk, and he wrote the book, the um, Tibetan book of living and dying, sorry. He says, imagine how things could be if we would live our lives infused with the sacred meaning. If our end-of-life care were always lit by the sense of awe in the face of death. So think about that. If our end-of-life care were infused with a sense of awe. And if we looked at life and death as an inseparable whole, so that death is just really part of living, it's something that we all do, and if we sought to make love and compassion really the measure of our every act, what a revolution that would be, and that we would all be... Um, free. We would be free to discover our birthright. I do believe, and I, my, it's my hope and my, my, my dream, is that all people have the right to die with dignity where they want to be, with the people they want to be, and unafraid. So, as an end-of-life doula, and if you're not familiar with that term, it comes from the ancient Greek. It's been around a long, long time. Um, it means a woman who helps another woman through childbirth and delivery and provides care for the family, the mother, and the infant after birth. It's interesting that we're now using this same term that we use to help usher in life. We're using it at the end of life as well. An end-of-life doula is someone who helps bring somebody and helps comfort somebody and provide care at the end of their life. The Dalai Lama says that as a newborn baby, we're all helpless, and without the care that we receive, we wouldn't have survived. So likewise, people at the end of their lives, we become fairly helpless and need care. And he says that this is one of the most important things that we can do, is to relieve 
people from discomfort and anxiety and to assist them, and that really our prime aim in helping a dying person is to put them at ease. I have a couple of stories about the work that I've been doing as a, my, there's no, thank you, uh, as an end of life doula. I was sitting with a woman once caring for her. I'd been working with her for about a, about a year and she was getting towards the end of her life. And she said, I feel very safe with you. Well, I was really flattered that she told me that. And I got to thinking about this woman. She was very demanding, very exacting. She wanted things a certain way. She would tell you over and over and over how she wanted them. And she was a little bit grumpy about it. She could be very critical with the people around her in her life. Well, this didn't bother me because I'm somebody, I like things a certain way. And when I get to a certain point in my life when I can't do those things, I might not be that happy about it. So I get it, and she got that I got it, and she felt safe with me. But I think also because she was nearing the end of her life and she was becoming weaker, she knew she needed someone to be there for her. And I realized that this was a very, very independent woman. She had raised a daughter on her own. She had been a career woman. And she didn't feel supported. She just didn't feel like there was someone there who could really take care of her. And she asked me to be around her more as she felt herself getting weaker and she was going to need more care, which was really terrifying to somebody who's always taking care of themselves. So that's one area that I feel I can be of help. I can provide comfort to somebody who's nearing the end of their life and help that person, guide that person, just like a midwife guides a woman through the birth process, I can help guide somebody and help somebody be unafraid at the end of their life. I've had some amazing experiences in this work. Um, I'm sorry, I wanted to tell you about what it has been like for us now where people die away out of view in hospitals or maybe even hooked up to machines um, having medical procedures. But I want you to imagine what it would be like if we had this scenario. A woman I knew was at the end of a terminal disease. She decided on her own with the help of her health care practitioners that she was going to have no more treatment and just get home and die in the presence of her loved ones and the home she loved with her pets that she loved. And she moved into the little house that she had built in her backyard. It was surrounded by woods. There was a little stream in the back. It was really kind of perfect. She had an art studio and a kitchenette. She had everything she needed right there. She was also a very independent woman and had always done things on her own and never needed help. When she got towards the end of her life, her family b became aware that she was going to need help. And they didn't want to be care providers. They wanted to be able to be the emotional support. After all, they were going through their own grief and their own loss. They were experiencing that they were going to lose this very beloved woman. So that's where I came in. Now, she had friends come and visit, but when she was tired, they would go to the main house. She had her little, little cute little house in the back. Um, we had birds singing. We had people would come um, and play music out the back window. There's a little, little pond and a fountain. It was just, it was really beautiful. And at the very end, she had chosen to be with her sister, and she took her last breath peaceful. She had resolved all the things that she had had to think about. Her family knew what her wishes were. There were no issues that came up. Oftentimes, there's a movement right now, a movement that's changing the way people have experienced death. It's called Death Over Dinner, and I encourage you to just look it up. It's, there's TED Talks and there's a website. It helps people talk about death. We don't talk about it because it's become so stigmatized and removed from everyday life. This movement helps you sit with your loved ones over dinner and talk about, you know, have a, do you have a medical proxy? Do you have somebody in your life who knows your wishes at the end of your life if you can't make decisions and they'll make them for you? These are all really critical things, having your assets and your, have you done a will? 
Um, have you had these conversations with the people in your life about what you would like, what you would not like in terms of medical intervention at the end? So this woman had had all of those conversations already. She was ready, and she slipped away very peacefully. Another thing that happened to me that was pretty amazing with this same woman, towards the end, a couple of days before she finally passed away, I was up in her room with her at night. At this point, she felt she wanted somebody close by in case she needed something during the night. And that's one of the things I can do besides providing comfort. I can make sure that you're not in pain. I can make sure that your pillows are plopped. <laughs> Um, if somebody needs to use the bathroom or needs to be uh, washed, I can do that. So during the night, she sat up in bed and said, oh, who are these people here? And I, she was sounded really delighted that she was being visited. Now, I've heard people on the brink of death have visits from people that they love, people that have passed on before. But this was a little bit different because she said, your family's here. This is your family, and they're so happy, and they're so delighted. And I asked her to describe who was here, and it was my partner from, who had died 21 years ago, and he was there in the room, according to her, with my children, the way they looked 21 years ago. My children are adults now. And she said, he's such a gentle man, and he's so happy, and he's so peaceful, and it just gave me this amazing chill. We both had tears in our eyes that... She was able to see through this permeable door between the worlds. It was there. It gave me such hope because at that time, I had been asking myself, more and more I've been working with people who are, who are dying, and I wondered to myself, is this the work I should be doing? Am I in the right place here? This is not exactly what I thought I'd be doing at this time in my life. And here was an answer to my question, I'm in the right place. If I'm able to provide comfort and care for someone who's in that place, accompany them to the door. I cannot go through the door with them. We're all going to die. We're all going to be alone when we die. But hopefully, we can provide comfort and care for people who are in that place so they can be unafraid so they can be comforted, so they can be at peace when they die. Thank you so much for being here today. I hope I've given you something to think about. Thank you.